welcome to Onria. Sorry. And uh, <laughs> I'm glad uh, I'm glad that we're back on. Although we have uh, obviously had some technical difficulties, but that's what happens after three months or four months off from from not doing those and uh, trying to get back into it. But uh, super happy to get back into the Onria spirit and start having some uh, great uh, webinars. Obviously, we have two great speakers tonight, um, and I'm just going to, um, obviously, we're going to get a few more minutes for people to get keep coming on after we had the difficulties here. So, um, but I just wanted to say thanks for everyone to uh, to come back to Andrea. Um, I hope there's, uh, well, we did have a whole bunch of new people sign up, um, some newbies. So, um, thank you for all the, the old, not old people, but for all those that have been with us before that keep coming back. Uh, really appreciate it. I'm glad that you're getting the value that you get month after month to, to keep coming back. And for all the newbies that uh, that signed up for their first one tonight, um, take notes. We have, like I said, two great speakers, two awesome topics. Um, you guys are going to want to take notes throughout the entire thing. And just we are recording it, so we will send it out to the people that uh, are on tonight. But you're going to want to take notes and pay attention to what's uh, being said. So welcome to everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Sean, what a great intro. I think that was your first intro for Onria ever. <laughs> I know. And all it took was technical difficulties. I've got zero Wi-Fi. I don't know what's going on <laughs> on your end, but that's good times. Well, here's the thing. So as people start joining, um, you know, make sure you say hi in the comments, and make sure before you do comment, You'll be able to click and see, it'll say um, that you're responding to just panelists. You wanna switch that to panelists and attendees, okay? Otherwise, it'll just be us that can see your comments. So make sure you do change that. Um, welcome everyone. So we do have some technical difficulties. I'm so glad. Thank you so much to Elizabeth Kelly for running point on this and like jumping Theology. in and like taking care of business. Uh, it's not always like this, I will say. I mean, we do have some issues from time to time, but normally our entire meeting isn't just canceled 15 minutes before we try and get started. So uh, thank you to everyone for hopping over and, uh, and joining us here. Um, and like Sean said, if you, um, you know, come in late, don't worry about it. We're going to be recording this. Um, Okay, so who who is here? Let's see in the chat. Where are people? Where are you joining us from? Why don't you tell us your city, um, whereabouts you are in the world? Typically, for those of you who are new, Sean and I um, run these meetings. We've been doing it for the last three years, uh, the last year virtually, and uh, typically we're sort of side by side here. But uh, right now, Sean is back in Canada, and I am in Florida. So uh, we're doing it sort of distance, which is the magic of, of uh, doing these virtually, right? It's nice that we can sort of be different places and still connect. Uh, so we have people joining us from London and Ottawa and Montreal, uh, Burlington, Walkerton, fantastic, Mississauga, all over the place. Um, welcome everyone from Markham, and more from Montreal. Awesome, guys. Thanks for taking time to be with us tonight. Um, I noticed as people were registering for Onria, um, I'm not sure, Sean, you might have mentioned we had about 200 people um, register for tonight's meeting, maybe a little bit more. And um, I noticed that there were about half were either brand new, had never done a deal before, um, so you're in that learning stage, that information gathering stage. And um, also in that sort of half are people who are just maybe doing their very first deal. So welcome to you. So glad you're here. Uh, you know, I know it can be a bit intimidating to join these events where, you know, there's other investors or maybe you don't think of yourself as an investor yet, but you definitely are. So um, welcome to you. We have... Uh, I want to say almost 100 people out of that registration group was intermediate investors. And then, of course, we've got our advanced investors who are doing investing full time. So Onria, if you're not familiar with who we are, we really want to be a space 
for everyone, you know, not just the advanced investor, but also those who are new to the game, you're trying to figure things we want to help everyone. And really, there's no reason why we can't, you know, even, even as in, uh, full-time investors or advanced investors, you can learn so much. And it's just these little tidbits we can pick up here and there that can make a difference. So um, with that, I'm going to let you know, first, I want to introduce um, Corey. So Corey, if you want to wave and say hi, Corey um, helps us sort of on the back end of things during our events. So Corey, why don't you just take a minute and tell people about yourself? Sure, and what happened today is 100% not my fault, okay? So, <laughs> um, investor from Sarnia, Ontario. I invest in Southwestern Ontario. Um, been do doing this for about 16 years. So um, been able to retire with real estate and now it's just great to be able to bring people together and give value like this. I, I think we all um, you know, need to get to that philanthropy giving back point. And it's great that we're all here to give back, which I think is like the top of the triangle for sure. Happy to be here to help. Did we lose Jen? Yeah. Sorry, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Corey. Um, now, of course, most of you probably, if you've joined us before, you know who Sean and I are. Um, you know, we're investors full time now. We live in Ontario, but recently relocated to Florida for um, sort of back and forth throughout the winter months. So uh, we began, we started Henri about three years ago now uh, out of the London area, London, Ontario, uh, so that we could bring, um, you know, bring investors, bring people like us together to share their knowledge. You know, we didn't want when we were running these in person. We didn't want this to be sort of a guru at the front of the room and, you know, salesy, like run to the back of the room and sign up for something. That really wasn't, you know, why we created Onria. We wanted to create a space where not only people could learn from one another, you know, education piece, but also where we could network with one another, which during COVID has made it a little challenging. So one sort of workaround that we have been using is to get active in the chat. So if you're here, I'm going to ask that you not be a fly on the wall. I want to see you get involved in the chat, okay? And even if that's just agreeing with a point or if, you know, if someone says something that's a real aha, you know, put some emojis in the, in the comments or something, you know, some way to stay engaged. Uh, the other way that you can sort of connect with people is to pay attention to that chat. You know, uh, to the side here, you see where people are coming in from. Um, you know, why don't you write down a few names? Maybe you see people close to you. This isn't to be creepy or anything, but you can always uh, connect with people online. You know, find them on Instagram or find them on Facebook. You know, if people want to put their Instagram handle in the chat, go for it. Like, this is your opportunity to connect with people. Um, so I'm just curious. We're going to make a little interactive piece here before we get started with the night. Um, if you are looking for a deal in Ontario, Southwestern Ontario, if you're looking for, <laughs> Sean, Sean's always looking for a deal, but if you're looking for a deal, um, put that in the, in the chat. Say, looking for a deal right now, tell us, is it a duplex? Is it a single family? Is it a student rental? Is it a multifamily? What are you looking for? Um, same thing if you're looking for cash, you know, if you have a deal and you're looking for a money partner, which Sean is, again, always looking for a money partner, uh, then put that in the chat as well. So let's just see what people are looking for. And guys, pay attention to that chat. I want you to jot down names. If you've got cash and you're looking to park it somewhere, then start to jot down a few names here, okay? When you see people saying they've got deals and they're looking for money and vice versa, okay? So that's a way that you can kind of sort of network a little bit with this, uh, this platform. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so we are going to get, as you guys keep going, keep going in the chat, I'm going to get started introducing our first set of guest speakers tonight. Uh, so we did something a bit different this time, and this is something I would like to continue doing every month, and it is doing an investor spotlight. And basically what I asked uh, Jake and Paula, Jake and Paula and Sean and I, we spent the last few days together here in Florida. Um, and it was amazing. It's so great to connect with people. It's been so long. Um, but I asked them to talk at tonight's event 
and basically just share their story. You know, people get into investing, real estate investing, for all different reasons. And they usually tie back to a central theme, uh, which is wanting freedom, whether that be time freedom, uh, you know, uh, money freedom, growing your wealth, um, and being able to do the things you want to do. So they're going to share how they got started, you know, why they got started, what their backstory was, uh, what strategies they got started with, and, you know, what have been some of their wins and maybe what have they learned along the way that they can share with us. So um, just to give you a little snippet, uh, Jake and Paula, they are online known as Tartan Developments, and uh, they're new to the game. They started in 2019, so just a couple years ago. Uh, they are former paramedics. They have four children, and within the past two years, they have both been able to retire from their previous careers and uh, be able to work in real estate full time. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to them. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, they're going to share their story. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks and, for having us. Yeah. Thanks uh, for having us on. Uh, we, we did a little uh, slideshow. Uh, so we'll fire that up. And uh, Paula made this. So it's my second time seeing it. So I'll, I'll struggle <laughs> through here. All right. Do I have to share a screen or anything? Or... Um, where is it? It's in here. Let's see here. Yeah. One sec here. All right. Can this, everyone see that? This is to keep us on track. So Thumbs we don't up. Yeah. start blabbing. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we're, uh, can you get that off the screen there? Sorry. Just trying to get the, get the screen so <laughs> I, I can see. I don't know how to do that. So it's fine. <laughs> Can't see the whole screen anyways. Uh, yeah. So uh, Jake and Paula, we're married. Uh, as mentioned, we have four kids, um, and we're we're retired from our our day jobs, um, but working full time in our business. Uh, the reason we got into real estate, um, there was there's kind of two reasons. Um, so we really didn't like our job. We struggled uh, physically and emotionally with that job, and just needed to needed an out. And we had a a really big interest in real estate, and that's kind of where um, where our path led us. Um, so yeah, Paula's been out for, I went on maternity leave in 2019 and never went back. So, yeah. And I, I, uh, I've been out since August or so just a couple months, but it's been, uh, great so far. One of the major things that we've noticed is both sleeping in our own bed every night. It's been really nice. <laughs> I've had it for a couple of years, but it's really nice for Jake. So all right, so our business, it's kind of evolved, um, but it has, as it stands now, so Paul and I, our responsibilities are, are finding deals, uh, whether that be um, uh, off-market marketing, uh, connecting with wholesalers, uh, referrals. So we have had a couple couple deals brought to us just because people know that, that we're looking to buy, um, and we have bought some off MLS as well. Our other responsibilities are uh, to raise money. So everything we do, I think we'll touch on this more. Uh, we use pretty much exclusively private money. Um, so the way we've done that, uh, we've done webinars on uh, investing your RSPs. Uh, we did a challenge called the 500K Challenge, which was through uh, Bill, and, Bill Allen at Seven Figure Flipping. And that was kind of like a daily daily social media thing that you'd have to do. And there was also um, some learning material and that was really good. And then things that we were taught was have a, have a good social media presence. Um, just kind of builds, uh, builds your reputation and. Um, yeah. Yeah. So our RSP webinar, we actually had a lot of help from Elizabeth um, and we targeted this towards paramedics. Basically, we were just doing it as like an education piece. We wanted to teach people that there's more to just relying on your pension. I think a lot of people get, you know, wrapped up in like, even when we were leaving our jobs, like you're leaving a pension and you're leaving benefits and like, how could you do that? So basically we just wanted to teach people like you can do more with your money, make more and have a little bit more freedom. Um, and that has come back to us. So we've had quite a few paramedics now invest with us, which is Awesome. Yep. And then, so obviously when we first started, uh, it was just Paul, Paul and I doing kind of everything. Uh, as we've kind of grown, uh, we've hired a full-time 
uh, office manager and also a part-time staff member that is in charge of our uh, short-term rentals. And then we are currently hiring a full-time project manager for uh, some of the flips and new construction projects that we have on the go. Just trying to get more of that freedom, like time freedom. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like it's, uh, yeah, we're just trying to get all that stuff organized and have more time to, to grow our business as opposed to kind of what we did today, which was uh, mm. running around grabbing... Uh, <laughs> Toilets, and toilets and, and yeah, it's just stuff like that. <laughs> All right. So our current uh, portfolio, and we never really set out to, to acquire like rental properties. It just kind of, I think we just kind of happened, happened upon it. And as I mentioned, I didn't make these slides. So I'll, I'll just mention this. This might be ahead. <laughs> but so in order to, in order to get out of our jobs, we kind of needed to replace our income. Right. And uh, the best way for us to do that was, was through an active active strategy as opposed to uh like like cash flow on uh on rentals <laughs> um so we decided to go that route and build a business around uh flipping and and now new construction homes which we'll get into but our current portfolio uh of which is in various stages of completion and uh renovation but when it's all done which should be in about six months uh we'll have 24 doors and we use the burr strategy if everyone's familiar with that I'm sure most people are, but that's uh, buy, renovate, renovate <laughs> rent. rent, refinance, <laughs> and repeat. So basically, uh, you're increasing the value uh, through strategic renovation, and then on uh, refinance, you're you're pulling out as much of your initial capital and renovation money as you can. So the goal there is to kind of have a property that you have a, the least amount of money into. If that makes sense. Yeah. And I did put a couple of scenarios in here to show um, like a successful burr that we did. So ways that we add value, we look to take a single family home and convert it to a duplex, which is very popular. Um, it's getting trickier to do in terms of numbers, but um, you can still find some good deals and still make it work depending on your strategy and your goals. Um, Duplex to triplex. So that middle picture is uh, duplex. Um, that's just a rendering. It's almost looking like that now. It's, it's like close, so yeah. close. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was a duplex that we converted to a triplex. So um, the reason we did that is that it was zoned for three units and we just took full advantage. So we end up splitting the main floor into two one bedroom units and then we have a three bedroom unit upstairs. Oh, my I'm, I'm, too fast. I'm giving Paul the uh, slow <laughs> down thing. Sorry. So. Um, and then that top picture. Um, it was like our, our crown jewel, I would say. Uh, that was an office building that we got driving for dollars. So our kids, when they were really little, would not nap except for in the car. So I would put them in the car and I would drive around and I would basically just be talking to the notes in my phone, recording addresses. And I saw two meters on this property and like, it's beautiful. And I just like, I love old buildings. So I, I put it on my list and we sent them a postcard. And we were actually in the lawyer's office signing another deal and he called Jake and uh, he, it was an office and he was like, the timing was right. He was looking to sell. So um, zoning happened to allow for four units. So we bought it. We ended up getting a 90% VTB at four and a half percent for a year. So we can do the conversion um, within the year and then refinance. Um, so other things we look for is kind of, we look for multifamily zoning. We really do hone in on zoning maps and try to find opportunity. A single family home, you can convert to, you know, a triplex or a fourplex in London. Um, if you get, sorry, <coughs> R3 zoning, it's either a triplex or a fourplex. But one thing you do have to keep in mind is that just because it's zoned for that doesn't mean that it's allowed. You have to, there's frontage criteria, lot size criteria. There's a lot of other criteria. So you just really keep an eye, you know, just because you see a listing or you see something that's, you know, R3, you know, allows for a fourplex, it may not and generally doesn't in the city of London. So yeah, not not to get into too much on, on the zoning, but zoning is huge. Um, there's definitely opportunity um, in unique uh, zonings. Um, and yeah, like Paula said, yeah, just because it's zoned for, for four units, you always see an MLS listings, oh, R3 zoning. And, and it might work out, but you're going to need uh, like minor variances, whether it be for parking, frontage, lot area, that kind of thing. But just something to keep in mind. It's not, it's still doable. For sure. But it's not always a guarantee and it will just take more time, which more time generally means more money. So um, that bottom picture is 
I would say our new crown jewel. <laughs> so this is in Stratford and it is a nine unit building that we bought off market. Um, it was listed on MLS probably a year and a half, two years ago. And I, you know, I saw it and I, I love the building, but it was just, we weren't at the stage at where we understood concepts and how to get this. And so just earlier this summer, I was thinking about it and I just looked up the owner and sent her a message on Facebook um, asking if she was still willing to sell and she was, so we met. And, um, so now we have this nine unit under contract. We will get it in January. We also got a 90% VTB at uh, 5% on this one. And she was wanting to have a VTB for five. We prefer, you know, to refinance as quickly as possible, get our money out. Um, so we kind of compromised on refinancing after one year, sorry. <clears throat> And this it's, is just to, so yeah, sorry. It's talking so faster, uh, throat's getting all messed up. <laughs> and this so. is just to help her um, defer her capital gains. Um, but anyway, so yeah, that's one thing that uh, we're really looking forward to getting. And we'll end up using it for six short-term rentals and three long-terms, because there are three long-term tenants in there now. And we'll keep them until they decide to leave. But um, Stratford's a pretty touristy town. Um, we've hired... Uh, a crew to kind of take over the short-term aspect of it in terms of marketing and it'll kind of be its own little business in itself um, and criteria that we look for when we're looking for something that we plan to keep is how much money are we leaving in there we ideally zero um, if it's you know something really good we'll leave a little bit in it really just depends and it must cash flow like cash flow is not um we're 100%. not yeah we're not investing that's with for with management with um uh, what am I saying here? Management, maintenance, uh, yeah. CapEx, all that kind of stuff. So we're going to move ahead here with uh, Paula. I didn't know Paula liked to talk Sorry. so much. I thought she was going to give you her whole life story there. For a <laughs> all second. right. So who wants to get into some numbers? So all right. this is a recent flip that we did. Do you want to talk about it? You're going to give me a turn, eh? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's see if I can. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is a recent one. Real quick. <laughs> yeah, I gotta go quick. I think we only have like two minutes left. You just talked about that phrase. <laughs> Anyways, uh, this is a recent one. We just, it just sold and closed. So we bought it off market, uh, $340,000. Uh, closing and carrying costs. Uh, so this one took uh, seven months, kind of close to close. Um, with the private money we use, it's pretty expensive. Uh, we used, uh, or we had a 4% lender broker fee, 9% uh, interest on the first position mortgage, which was 100%. Uh, legal, land transfer fees, utilities, taxes, and the interest we paid on the renovation funds was $50,000. Uh, the renovation was $120,000. And we sold that one for six fifty one, dollars And the realtor fees were $30,000, just over $30,000. And that one was a profit of $109,000. And then realtor got her 2% as well. <laughs> That's Paula. That was her, that was her joke. <laughs> Uh, so this is one that we did. Which one's this one, Paul? Is this the uh, one this we kept? This is a burr, yeah. Yeah, so this is kind of a, one of the first uh, uh, duplex conversions we did that we kept. Um, so this one we bought for four thirty-five. dollars uh, Closing and carrying costs, kind of the same same deal as the last one. That was just over $48,000. Uh, renovation was $140,000. And we got an appraisal at eight hundred, dollars which is more than we anticipated. We were kind of thinking like seven fifty, dollars and then we would have left around like forty dollars or fifty dollars in. Um, but this one, we got 800 and we were actually able to pull a little bit of money out. Uh, so I guess the, uh, the perfect burr, they call it, uh, we pulled 14 grand out tax-free and then the rents there are 3,900 for, for both units or sorry, for both units included. Uh, we separated hydro. Uh, so with all the things that I mentioned, 2% vacancy, I think I used five and five for maintenance and CapEx out. We self manage that one, so that's not in there. Even though I said to put that in before, uh, but it's three sixty six a month cash flow, which is uh, eh, not great. That's kind of why we mentioned we couldn't really retire on on cash flow. cash flow. Not us, anyways. We would we would need a lot of uh... a lot of doors. So that's that one. Uh, so this is kind of our. I don't think we. I feel like we didn't really give a whole whole backstory much, eh? So we kind of started about eighteen months ago, full time. I think I do talk about that. Oh. I, I didn't make the slides. I so. rearranged them and now I don't. Anyways, <laughs> so yeah, we started about 18 months ago. Uh, so in the last 18 months, this is kind of what we've done. So we've done, uh, oh, sorry, I said 18 months, 23 months <laughs> there on the slide. 27 deals in 23 months. 
uh, 58% of those deals were off market and 42% were MLS. Uh, so some of those off market were sourced uh, from us. Like uh, we do Facebook ads, uh, direct mail marketing. Uh, the rest was wholesalers and some actually just networking. Yeah. Uh, private money. So in the last 23 months, we've raised over, what do we got there? Almost, Almost 12, 12 million. million. Um, and then for every project that we sell, uh, we like to give back. Uh, so there's a, um, what do you call it? Like a, not company. A charity. Charity, there you go. Uh, it's called I've Got Your Back 911. It's kind of related to uh, first responders. Uh, so we donate $500 for everything we sell uh, back to them. And then, so I'm just reading these slides for maybe the <laughs> first or second time. So this is how we left our job in under two, our jobs in under two years. And uh, I'm going to give Paul another chance to speak here. Hopefully she slows it down and doesn't uh, go too far back uh, in history. Here. So really, yeah, yeah. Uh, the biggest factor for us was hiring a coach. Um, 100%. You know, we coach. wouldn't be where we are now without the coaches that we've hired. Yeah. Um, I'd like to was, think that. That was my turn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Paul wants to, yeah. Okay. Well, it's true. We, we you know, we. We invested in a coach right off the hop. We could have, you know, watched, you know, YouTube videos and read books and we could have done all that for who knows how long. Um, but it was hiring a coach that really pushed us. I think making the financial commitment was one thing where it was like, okay, we've just spent, you know, like all this money, we need to get it back. Um, and then it also gave us a huge confidence boost and uh, really mindset for us. Um, we always say like coaching is 90% mindset, 10% nuts and bolts. And it, that's exactly it. So we started with Stefan Arnio. Um, he unfortunately passed away in May of 2020. And then we were lucky enough to continue on with Razna of Black Card as well. And we went a full year with Razna. So um, we had, we, we owe Razna a ton. Um, she helped us immensely grow our business to where it is today. Uh, in September, we started with Elizabeth Kelly, and you'll hear her later today. Um, we're still coaching with Elizabeth. Elizabeth has been monumental in getting our business on track. Um, I, I don't even know where we would be without Elizabeth. Like, we feel like we're, you know, we've got things under control. Things are, we have systems, we have processes. Um, and yeah, we're taking along pretty well. And then we actually just uh, hired a coach. We've had one session. Um, and Elizabeth actually... Um, Kind of put us in touch with him it's uh bruce firestone uh, so he's helping us with um our our small scale development um and so far so good it's been awesome and how are we doing for time i don't even know what i'm doing on this uh zoom thing but are we good for time you're good you're totally good yeah okay sweet. Yeah. we're almost sweet. done here. great it's a great presentation i'm sure <laughs> all right so in order to quit our jobs we needed uh i kind of mentioned it before uh we wanted like a a sustainable scalable business to replace our income and how we did that was through uh, flips, and now we're we're moving towards new construct new construction single family homes. Uh, so we are carry on registered, pending just kind of uh, approval of that, and we have uh, three new construction homes lined up, lined up for for next year. As soon as the uh, weather gets nice, and then sh we're we're trying out the short term rentals. It's going pretty good now. Uh, it just kind of gives us a little more cash flow. Uh, Paul is a realtor, so that helped. And passive income, which we try not to re to really touch, um, is just the long term rentals that we have, and uh, we're doing private lending as well. And this picture here that Paula so nicely <laughs> put in uh, is me, real t real deal, calling in. Uh, what does it say? Calling quit. Yeah. So I was supposed to work. Little story. We were we were waiting for a refinance, which relied on my my job. Um, so we were just waiting for that. And then I knew I was going to quit. And, uh, we got a call from our lawyer at like 4 PM saying everything closed. I was supposed to work that night, actually all weekend. And I, I called in that night and, uh, resigned. So that's pretty cool. All right. So what's next for us? Um, our motto for 2022 less is more. Uh, so we're trying to do higher profit margin, um, projects, uh, and less of them as opposed to, so initially we would, we would do anything kind of like 40, 40 to 50 K profit. I'd be like, yeah, let's do it. Now we're looking at, uh, a minimum of hundred K profit. Um, and then, like I said before, we're trying to move our business towards new construction homes. Um, 
on the, I guess it's the right there, you'll see uh, that's a rendering of a house we're building in Stratford. Um, and then we're also kind of, I didn't follow the slide, so I'm off back. <laughs> I'm off, I'm off face here. Hold on a sec. And then, uh, so yeah, we're going to do uh, four to five uh, new construction homes for 2022. That's our goal. Uh, we already have three lined up. Uh, five to 10 flips, but like I said, it's got to have a minimum of 100K profit. Um, and then we have, this is another kind of aspect we're trying to grow. I think maybe I'm a little bit more interested in this than Paula, but uh, it's like small scale development. So we have a six unit prop property, uh, or six unit building we're building in Strathroy, which is uh, just west of London. And then we have a three to five unit building in London that we're building. And I say three to five, uh, just because we're not not sure how many units the city's going to let us uh, let us do so, um, and then we want to acquire one to two more development projects for Paul says twenty twenty three. I would say twenty twenty two. We'll buy them in twenty twenty two. Yeah, and then start in twenty twenty three. They take time. <laughs> and then yeah, any any buy and holds uh, that make sense for us and uh, are interesting. So that's kind of what what's up next for us. Let's see what's on the next slide here. Uh, tips for success. And I'll let Paula do this one. So these are kind of things that we think will like set us up for success. So we invest in ourselves right off the hop. Uh, we always buy right. Um, we we always buy right. So we're buying. She says always, but okay. We try to. Yeah. We try to buy right. Mistakes have been made. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone will make mistakes, yeah. but even the mistakes we've made have not been terrible. Yeah, no, mistakes. huge. Yeah um set goals goals 100%. are really important that's something we really struggled with in the beginning you our, write write them down for sure our first phone call with Stefan he was like tell me your goals and we told him and he was like he, he was like those are terrible goals we just didn't understand the concept of setting goals so it's something you should look into it's not as just as easy as it's saying like writing like, down yeah like uh, I want to do this it's like yeah. I want to do this by when how and map out a plan you need to map out the whole plan 100% hire the right team member so you know uh, investor focused um, like mortgage team. You almost said realtor because you wanted to plug yourself. Oh, right? Yeah, investor focused <laughs> realtor, um, lawyer, all that stuff. Like you know, we're we're fortunate now. If we have a question or we have something we want to run by our lawyer, you know, it's as quick as picking up a phone call and being like, "Hey, like, what do, what do you think about this?" And having that team member is it's been amazing. Just having that um, network with other investors, you learn so much from other people doing what you're doing or what you want to be doing. And have a social media presence. Let people know what you're doing. Um, I think it's a great way to build credibility. And credibility, know, that was the word I was looking for before. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> definitely builds credibility. I know that it's been spoken about at Onraya before, and I I agree completely. I think it was Sarah Edder that was talking about um, social media presence, and it's very important. All right. I'm, I'm so excited to see what's on the next slide. <laughs> we did a presentation last night, and I'm getting them mixed up. This is not the same as the last one. <laughs> Anyways, that's it. Hey, hey, we're done. I thought we had pictures and stuff. No, no, I didn't put any. Pictures oh, in. I thought we had pictures. Night. That was last night. I was waiting for <laughs> to show you guys something, but it's not there. What so, are you showing? I want to show the new builds. We had the one, but we got a couple other ones. Oh. Anyways, yeah. So thank you. I hope I hope that was uh, you know it's somewhat informative. Anyways, uh, here's our contact info. And yeah, we're going to go to. We're we're like most active on Instagram. If you're looking to yeah. to connect to us, so. We gonna open up the chat. You gonna open up the chat? Yeah, let's do okay. it. Oh my goodness! Amazing. Thank you, guys. Yeah. So we did have some uh, questions come in, and I've got some things I want to ask as well. Okay. So do it. Um, so one of the questions that came in was back to your property in Stratford that you picked up, um, and you mentioned that you were doing some short-term rentals. So where do you plan on uh, hosting those? Is that like Airbnb or? Or are you doing it um, independently? So we, we're not fully decided yet. Initially, it was going to be Airbnb. Um, but we have this team now that specializes in short-term rentals in terms of marketing. And they'll do like a, um, a website for this place. So this was operating fully as an in pre-COVID. So there's no long-term tenants in there. It was 100% an in, which is also why it's out on MLS. People struggled to finance it. So she had... People put on her contract numerous times. They couldn't get the financing um, because of the short-term rental aspect. So anyway, um, yeah, that's the plan. Probably will be on Airbnb, but we'll also have a separate booking and website for that place. Awesome. Cool. Uh, let's see. There were, um, was there any in the Q&A? No. 
So, uh, and that was my fault. I didn't do that housekeeping piece. So um, let me go back through, or if you have a question, oh, let's see. Um, someone asked, why do you change coaches all the time? Uh, uh, we, we haven't changed coaches. Uh, it's just been a progression. So our first coach was uh, Stefan Razna. And then uh, we're working with Elizabeth now and continue to work with her. And then the latest coach that we have is for something totally different. So uh, it's a continuous process. And then we hire people for what we're looking to be coached at, if that makes sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's quite a number of newer investors here. Yeah. What was something, um, you know, how did you know who to pick as a coach? That might be something that people are struggling with. You know, who do I go with? Actually, funny story. So when we were, we decided, it's not funny actually, but that's <laughs> what people say, right? It's a funny story. Um, so Paul and I decided, we were like, we're going to do this full time. Let's hire a coach. And I actually reached out to Sean. I think I asked him if he coached because he was someone... You, both you guys were someone that we looked up to and I was like, wow, we want to do that, right? Like, this is amazing. Um, and you guys weren't coaching at the time, but he said, Stefan Arneo. And I'm like, okay. And we looked into it. I didn't even, I don't even think I knew who he was at that time. And then as we got looking, um, we're like, oh my God, like he's just like all these people, like Corey coached with Stefan, you guys coached with Stefan. There's a whole bunch of people that coach with Stefan. And I was like, okay, let's, if we're going to do this, let's do this. Right. And uh, I, I liked what he had to offer and, so did Paula. So we, we decided uh, to go with him. For yeah. us too, it's like a personality thing. Like we have to drive. I don't want to feel like I have to, you know, pretend to, or like, you know, hide my true self. We, we want to be authentic and that's yeah pretty important to us. So we like that he was like, no bullshit. Right. Yeah. Like, and then for Elizabeth, I think we found her, uh, on Andrew Hines. Yeah. Podcast. Um, and then the, the newest coach Bruce's actually came from Elizabeth. So yeah. And with Elizabeth, she was on there on Andrew Hines talking about like large scale multifamily. And we're like, Oh, that's next. Like we were going to do large scale multifamily. That's, you know, that's what we want to do. Um, and then we, you know, started working with Elizabeth and like started breaking down our business and she got us to really narrow down and focus on what we truly wanted to do. So like neither of us really enjoy being landlords. So, which is why we're kind of taking the short-term rental approach. Um, about which properties we keep and which and which ones we sell so working with her we realized like that large-scale multifamily isn't really for us at least not at that point so um we got to focus on other things um and then yeah now we're we're wanting to do more development so we're shifting to a coach that really focuses on development amazing and you know what i really liked about what you said was that you didn't want to do the the YouTube thing, you know, trying to teach yourself. You had made up in your mind, this is what we're going to be doing. Let's get someone to teach us. And you said investing in that lit a fire under your butt to like make your money back, right? So yeah, unlike, some, unlike some people who are sort of trying to figure it out, it's not a big deal if they go maybe six months and don't put a, you know, an offer in. Whereas you were like, hang on, I've paid for coaching. I need to like yeah. make this money back. And Paul and I are like super impatient people too. So, <laughs> and at the time we we're like, we got to like, there was, I remember another story, not funny, but another story. <laughs> when we first talked to Stephanie, he's like, there's, I, I can't remember exactly what he said, but he's like, there's two things that motivate people. Uh, it's pain and pleasure, which I agree with. And at that time when we started, we had both. So our pain was like, we got to get out of our jobs. This is like brutal. Like I'm not, I can't, that's two years is not an option. Like it did take two years, but like, at the time, like this has to happen now, right? Like I'm not gonna fart around for, for 10 years. Like this has to happen now. So let's let's uh, fast track this and, and let's do this. And then obviously, was I say pain and pleasure and then pleasure, obviously we wanted to create a better uh, lifestyle for our family, so. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, let me see here. <laughs> Got lots of stories. <laughs> I'm just trying to go back through the chat to see if there were, some other questions and if someone if, if you guys typed a question in and it's kind of way back pop it in again Jen, um sorry. yeah Jen, there are two questions in the q a i don't know if you can see that or not oh let me okay i only see one so go ahead and why don't you read those out because i can't see the other one for some reason Sure. Wendy said, I've heard the current government is no is looking to no longer allow flips. Any word or thought? You want my thoughts on the government? 
we can do that. We don't have time for that. We, we don't do have time for that. Uh, so yes, there is talk about that. I don't know if it's not allowing or just a higher tax. There, I, I can't say. Sure. It was um, a flipping tax if you sold a house within a year, I, I believe is yeah. what it was. I, I um, think if you're vaccinated, you're exempt though. That's, that's <laughs> a joke. It's a vaccine joke. Sorry. Uh, but anyway, also why we're transitioning, it's not why we're transitioning to new construction, but it helps that we are transitioning to new construction. So, you know, if flips no longer are feasible or we can't, you know, hit that profit margin with the new tax that we want. Yeah, then there's, there's a huge housing shortage in uh, Canada and Ontario. Uh, which is only going to get worth, worse with immigration. Um, and it's, yeah, new construction was something we wanted to do. But I actually, uh, I actually have a funny story. This is so. this one better be funny. <laughs> um, I was at one of our flips and uh, the liberal candidate door knocked on at the flip and he was like, hey, can I get your vote? And I was like, actually, no. Um, you're I'm in my flip. Like, I'm a flipper and you're imposing this tax. And he was like, Oh, well, they're a real big problem. And I was like, well, how like how many flips are happening in Canada a year? And he was like, oh, like, I don't know, but enough, enough for this. And I was like, if you can't answer that question, like how like I I would I would be curious to know how many flips are happening in Canada that are, you know, creating this crisis in the housing market. But anyway. yeah, that's all that's that was a funny story though. <laughs> it was, was funny. Like um, he didn't come to my house, he was at a house that I was yeah. flipping. So well, yeah, that's that's a yeah, it's a whole other story. But to sum it up, yeah, I I have heard that and I I I think it'll just be a, a tax, but whatever. I hate the government. Anyways. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> yeah, what's next? <laughs> the second question was, Chloe asked if you have a cash flow amount that you aim for with your buy and hold properties. $200 a door. That's for long term. But, but yeah, try to get in terms of like having like a maximum amount or a goal that we're trying to get to, we don't. We just, we really just buy the ones that, we like we like yeah, yeah or the and just make that... sure and I, like i said it before just make sure you you're using real numbers on your on your uh your maintenance and vacancy and all that stuff so yeah yeah 200 bucks a door which is not very much uh rosa has a question here well first she said great presentation oh um, thank you <laughs> glad you liked it <laughs> almost 12 million in private lending so did yep. you always use private lending or did you start with the banks first and then move to private when you needed to yeah so the first project we ever did um we were able to kind of finance uh like through scotia it was a flip flip severance um so we qualified for that with our jobs and then from then on it, we moved into to private money just to kind of get to where we wanted to get like scalability wise we needed to use private so it was yeah we would only one, be able to do one at a time if we were using our own yeah we can only do one we wanted to do more so awesome and that's uh, a great point if you are thinking of leaving your job um you should uh get as much money as you can pull out those lines of credits and like okay. Yeah, Make use sure. of the banks while you can, because once you leave your job, it gets a lot more challenging. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, Sean had a question. Um, if you would ever buy a house full of frogs. <laughs> yeah. Frogs and snakes. Never, 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 never. I got a question yeah. for him. <laughs> no, you don't. But I won't ask it. We had a little incident with a frog here in Florida, which was yeah. I, I don't like frogs, <laughs> um, so whatever. That's normal. <laughs> Everyone has their thing. It's fine. Yeah. Um, let's see here. We have another question. Did you find the T four is really only crucial for the first one? Uh, so, so it was crucial for the first couple refinances we did. Um, but I think eventually we would have got to the point where that it, we were kind of capped out anyways on our, our income. So we've moved to a uh, credit union, which doesn't really factor in. Um, it doesn't factor in our income. It's based on the, the property itself and how that performs. Um, so that's where we're at, at now. It's a little, little bit of a higher interest rate. I think we're at about three right now. And then just and getting only, 75% yeah. loan to value as opposed, to, <laughs> as opposed to, 80. to 80. But with much, it's worth it to not have to work. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and let's see, we got another question here. In terms of private funds, yep. uh, did you go through mortgage brokers? Is it promissory notes, registered funds, or like a mixture? It's a mixture. So we 
we have a great relationship with a couple of brokers that we use. Uh, we try to raise as much as we can on our own because it ends up being a little bit less money. Um, we did that RSP webinar, which got a lot of um, registered funds. Yeah, yeah, a lot of registered funds. Um, even some promissory notes too. We have people who you know maybe didn't have quite a large um, RSP, and they like had a hundred hundred thousand dollar line of credit, and so they're they did that on a promissory note, like stuff like that. Um, yeah, just, yeah, it's just, we just next yeah, we brokers. really do try to raise as much as we can on our own. And I think a lot of people find that intimidating and scary, which it is at first, but once you do it and you like, I feel like once you do it once, you're, I was like, Whoa, that was awesome. Like that was like, that was fun. Yeah. Like let's, let's think, do it again. I think as you get more confidence, I think it gets a little bit easier. When we first started, it was like, you feel like you're like almost begging or asking for the money, but whereas now it's we have the confidence in ourselves and the projects that we have that we're actually providing a, a service for the people that are lending, lending us the money. So. Yeah. And we're also lenders now. So we understand it from the other side and like, we're, you know, like if we have money, we don't want it sitting, we want it out. So we, it kind of shifted our mindset from thinking like, Oh, I, I need this. Like you're helping me to being like, no, like we are actually helping you. So. I totally get that. Yeah. Um, Okay, a couple more questions here. Uh, <laughs> so someone was asking, um, how did you negotiate the VTB with the seller? Um, I think, I don't know if that was talking about one specific deal yeah. or if that's like an in general question. Oh, I just asked for them because the worst you can get is no. So, it, and I always try to, I always try to frame it in a way that helps them as well. And I think, in both times that we've, well, we've had other times, but these two times that we spoke about today that got, have, um, that we got VTBs that one was like, he's like a wealthy businessman. He, it was like not a big deal to use private, like to the private money concept wasn't a big deal. Um, and then the in that took a little bit of, uh, convincing, I would say like she, you know, she wasn't super comfortable with it. And I explained it to her and the, the benefits to her. Um, and then, and like the security too, like she, you know, it was still, she had good security. And then when we made her an offer, we gave her two options, one with the VTB, one without, and she took the one with the VTB because it was the better deal. So. Awesome. Um, let's see, we got another one here. So this is from Tyler. Oh, Tyler. Hello. I was talking to you earlier today. Uh, if you had a house that was worth 500,000 after repair and you only owed 260 on it and getting 2,800 a month plus utilities per month, uh, would you sell it and take the money or keep the cash flow? It sounds like a very specific- Like a spreadsheet, that one. <laughs> I know. Um, you can email us, we'll yeah, email, if email us. If you have a question. Yeah. Yeah, Why don't you, here for yeah me. how about that? That's a little bit much. Um, but you were talking about cash flow and how you sort of were deciding what to do with, like, you can't retire on cash flow, right? So, well, well yeah, I know some people property. have. Yeah, for, for the, the properties properties that we were looking to buy, uh, it was in, in the market that we're in, uh, it wasn't a realistic option for us to retire off cash flow. Quickly. Quick. I mean, right. yeah, even like, yeah. And we spend a lot of money. So. We, we yeah. need a lot. So it Gotta would feed take those, us. Feed those kids, you know? <laughs> but. Um, yeah, so what was I saying? Yeah, uh, I don't know. Anyways, yep. <laughs> okay, we'll take one more question here. Yeah, uh, more. Is finding land to develop challenging and do you have to compete with bigger developers? Uh, it is challenging, yes. Uh, competing with bigger developers, no. I would say we're competing with um, home builders. Um, so yeah, yes, it's challenging. Uh, you can find something if you're if you're combing the mls you can sometimes come across something then you're competing with probably uh uh like home buyers for themselves uh so we we have like a, a database of properties that we've kind of hand selected um for different criteria whether it be size like lot size uh lot size plus zoning um that sort of thing that we we uh do direct mail marketing to so yes it's challenging to answer your question all right. Actually, I, there's one more question here. because it's good. I like this one. Uh, not that I didn't like the other ones, but uh, aside from a BTV, how are you able to hold properties since you both left your jobs in the past two years? Uh, so during renovation, we're using private funds. So it doesn't matter for our uh, 
income. And then on refinance, uh, like I mentioned before, we're using uh, credit, credit union. union. So it doesn't rely, it's how the property performs. Uh, you get a little bit less uh, loan to value and a little bit of a high, not even higher interest rate, but a, a little, little, bit bit high, little bit higher, but still good. Um, mm -hmm. So we're getting 75% and around 3% uh, interest rate. And it, and they also base it on relationships too. So like we kind of, we sold ourselves to them. We, you know, yeah, we, we gave, gave them, them a bio, bio and a story and yep. showed them, you know, all the things that we were doing and like how we, you know, the success we were having and it's worked out. It is definitely about relationships. With yeah. The credit our, union and our, our, uh, private mortgage brokers, the same thing too. It was all relationship based. Right. So, um, they know us and what we're doing and, and our past projects. So, um, yeah, that's how we did it. Fantastic. Well, thank you guys so much for mm -hmm. joining us tonight and for sharing your story and going into detail on some of your deals. Uh, it's always great to sort of get a peek behind the curtain. You know, when people see you at Onria, they see you at different things, you know, they see your online ads, they know that you are investors. It's nice to see sort of what kind of deals you're doing, how you got there. Um, you know, there's a lot of newer people who, you know, this is their goal is what you guys are living and you were able to do it in two years. So it's really fantastic to, to see that all the things that you've been done and, and willing to share with us. So thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thanks for having I'll, us. I'll end this with a, another funny story because you just mentioned <laughs> that. Uh, yes, anyone can do it. Cause I remember I was actually going to start with this, but I forgot. So <laughs> Paul and I, I remember going to Andrea, Paul and I first time. And I don't know if we'd done one deal, maybe or something like that. And I was like, oh man, like we were in awe of everyone. We just sat there at our table. Um, so yeah, so take action, uh, get educated. And, you know, two years from now, you can be doing. I want to say it was like November, maybe October, November, 2019 was the first time you went to Andrea. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So thanks for having us on. I really appreciate it. It was actually, uh, Quite a big honor. So I hope uh, everyone enjoyed the presentation. <laughs> Absolutely. And this is your date night. This is, is uh, yeah, this is date yeah. night. Yeah, we're, we're out of Airbnb. Right I got a bottle, our own, our bottle own of wine I brought with me. Not touching it. Gonna crush that. Yeah, Paul's, <laughs> yeah, you guys know, I guess Sean and Jen know what's up. Paul's gonna chug that and no. maybe another one and then sleep for a couple days. So. <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. Well, thank you guys. Enjoy the rest of your night. And uh, again, thank you guys for, for speaking and spending your evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. you. All right, so we are going to um, move along here. Uh, let me just see here. Can everyone, who can you, I don't, there's, they're still not sharing a screen, right? No. Can everyone see me? Yes. We, can, <laughs> we see the gallery. We see uh, the five different okay. screens. Excellent. Perfect. So um, if you haven't been active in the chat yet, guys, make sure you do get in there. I saw a couple people drop their Instagram handles. Um, one person mentioned he was looking for deals in Peterborough, I think. So keep getting in there. And like I said, make note, like jot down a few names of people that you don't know and reach out to them on Facebook, you know, find, find these people again, don't be creepy, but just be like, Hey, you know, I saw you or in attending Onria, you know, I'd love to connect and get to know each other because like Paula and Jake just said, uh, you know, real estate investing is a people business. And the more people who know you and know what you're trying to do, uh, the better it is for you. And it could be for them. They might have money that they're looking to park somewhere. Um, so the more that you can talk to each other and grow your network, the better. Corey, you're a great proponent of this. How many contacts do you have now on your phone? It always blows me away when you're like, guys, network, look at how many people I have. Yeah, real estate investing, it really is a contact sport. I remember at one of the, probably the last on you that we were able to do in person, I just said, open up your iPhone, go to your contact page, and then scroll down to the bottom, and it'll show you, if you have an iPhone, how many contacts you have. I think it was 4,200 or something like that. Um, so I've obviously been collecting contacts for over 20 years, but, it, you know, when I saw some of the millennials, they're like, I have 78. I'm like, well, there, there's an opportunity for you to, to have more contacts. There, right so and it's it's about relationships it's about remembering things about people and making notes and being able to stay in touch over a long period of time absolutely absolutely so i see people are popping into the chat giving their uh, instagram handles and that sort of thing fantastic um okay so 
Um, let me see here what else I want to tell you before I introduce our next um, speaker here. There we go. Um, Sean, where's Sean? Is he still on here? I know his internet was a little sketchy. Uh, maybe he stepped away for a minute. Um, but to let everyone know something that I'm going to share, shameless plug, is that Sean and I wrote a book. Um, earlier this year, we released it about a month ago. It became an Amazon bestseller. And uh, the name of it is called Investing for Freedom. So if you are interested in, you know, reading that, and, and it's all short stories, it's nothing heavy. <laughs> um, but if you're looking for to hear our, a bit of our story, then uh, you can head on over to Amazon and, uh, and pick that up. I think it's like $14.99 or something. Um, but there's some, some additional motivation for you. Uh, oh, look at that. Corey's got his book. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Did it just arrive? Yeah, I just ordered it on the weekend. Nice. Fantastic. Well, thanks. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, we are going to move into our next speaker. And if you guys don't have a pen and paper handy, um, I would suggest you grab a notebook because you're going to want to make some notes. Um, close off all the other tabs you have open. This is good. You're going to want to pay attention here. Uh, last year, Elizabeth Kelly, actually, I think it was this time last year, wasn't it, Elizabeth? Um, Elizabeth joined us and shared a whopper of a presentation. She is so full of knowledge. And tonight, she's going to share more information on creative financing and negotiating the deal. Um, you know, whether you are new as an investor or you've been in the game for a while, these are skills that you need all the way through your investing career. So to give you a little snapshot, um, Elizabeth has been a real estate investor now for I believe 15 years. Um, she is specializing in the multifamily and rent to own space. Um, she's the leading provider of housing in Kirkland Lake, way up in Kirkland Lake. <laughs> um, and she also owns along with her husband, a property management company. Uh, in addition, she does, as we know, coaching and consulting and has worked with a lot of uh, investors like Jake and Paula who have been able to elevate their investing game by working with her. So uh, we have definitely gone to the right source here to learn a lot more uh, and hopefully we can apply this because again, Onria is not just about learning and networking, it's about taking action. So with that, I'm going to leave it to Elizabeth Kelly. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Jen. Really appreciate it. It's uh, it's quite an honor to be here, especially to come back for, for a second year. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much to all of you who have given us um, your evening, and it's great to see all of you here. It's uh, It's been quite an adventure the last 18 months. I'm sure a lot of you have found um, at times it's been somewhat challenging. So good for you for getting out there and continuing to take action. And I have a presentation I'm going to share with you. And it just, give me one second here. There we go. Bear with me here. I don't have a fancy Mac like, um, <laughs> like Paula and Jake. Uh, so it's a little bit different. But um, today, this evening, um, Jen, I gave list a, a Jen a list of topics and I said, tell me what you think your members would like to hear the most. And she came back and she said, I want creative financing and negotiations. And I was like, fantastic. And how do I put that together in a, a presentation that people will end up with some, some good tangibles? So Jake and Paula, thank you so much for the kind words earlier. It's, uh, it's really been an honor to work with you over the past year, and I'm so excited to see what you're going to accomplish in the, the coming years. And you did a great job teeing this up because what I think will be beneficial for everybody is to talk tonight about how negotiating like a superstar leads to creative financing. 
So I have a little disclaimer that I always give. So I say I'm not an accountant, lawyer, or other professional. My information is strictly from experience. Please seek professional advice when needed. I absolutely believe in the value of hiring the professionals who know what you don't know to share that information with you and make sure that you don't, that you're setting yourself up for success when you're starting out on your, on your journey in real estate. So I really like to make presentations interactive because I know now, you know, where it's after eight o'clock at night, you know, kids might be, you know, asking for some time. Maybe we've had a couple of glasses of wine, whatever it is. I like to make my presentations as interactive as possible. So I have a question for you and I will ask questions throughout the presentation. If you guys don't mind it, Type your answers in the chat box. If you have a question that specifically pertains to the presentation, if you wouldn't mind doing me a favor and just put it in the Q&A box and I'm more than happy to answer uh, any questions um, as we sort of work our way through the information. But my first question for everyone attending is, what is creative financing? So based on you know, your knowledge, your information, what is creative financing to you? <clears throat> And people are thinking, it's very quiet. Okay, so Tyler says it's getting money from private lenders. Okay, perfect. Um, Jen says non-bank, non-credit union financing, getting funds from different sources. I'm not sure if I put the chat on here, if you guys can see that or not. Um, when you put little of your own money or none of your own money, Okay, good. Funding a deal away from conventional sources, good. <clears throat> Finding a way to make a win-win for both buyer and seller. Love that one, Corey. Using life insurance, Nikki, that's a great example of creative financing. So I, I think sometimes it's easier to talk about what creative, what isn't creative financing. So it's really clear, you know, this is our typical residential deal. So traditional financing from a bank or a credit union at 80%, cash at 20%. Now, the awesome thing is that means creative financing is basically anything else. So it really comes down to how creative do we want to be? And are we listening to the cues in order to figure out how to put together creative financing for each particular deal? So when we talk about creative financing, we talked about private lending, joint venture partners would be considered uh, a form of, of creative financing, vendor takebacks, VTB, seller financing, um, forgivable loans, we can do sliding scale payments, we can do strategic closing dates, we can do alternative valuations. And this is one of the tools that Jake and Paula utilize so effectively where they're buying properties well under market value, and then they're having people lend funds based on what the fair market value is uh, through private lending. So they're able to do 100% loan to purchase price because they're buying for, sorry, 100% loan to fair market value because their purchase price is so much lower. So there's a lot of different ways that we can be creative. Um, anything else that anybody is familiar with here? Anything that's not included that people can think of? Okay, so here's the thing that a lot of people don't understand, RRSPs. Yep, absolutely, Tyler. So that would be private lending from registered funds as opposed to from somebody, you know, taking money from a home equity line of credit or a line of credit, absolutely. So here's the thing that a lot of people don't realize about creative financing is you can learn the strategy and what it means and you can get a clause, but none of that matters if you can't build a relationship with the person that you are negotiating with in order to set up that financing. So I think if we talk to Paula and Jake, they would tell you they didn't say, hey, can I buy your property? And by the way, uh, will you hold uh, a vendor take back mortgage at 90% for five, you know, 90% loan to value at 5% interest? They're going to tell you that, you know, they built a relationship. In fact, I know the lady that they bought the nine unit from, they must have met her for coffee three or four times. And then they presented the idea of, of the vendor take back and showed her why it was so beneficial. So 
when we talk about creative financing, we think a lot of times, well, it must be just to do with the seller. And, and it's not because we can do creative financing with joint venture partners. We can do it with private lenders. I have a lot of coaching clients who say, well, you know, I, I, you know, how much can I borrow money for? And, and, you know, what rates am I going to be charged? And the answer is that depends on your ability to negotiate and to help people understand how you're providing value for them when you're borrowing their money. So anybody can learn creative financing strategies, but your effectiveness as a negotiator is going to be what will determine how receptive people are to your request. So there's some qualities that I want to share with you that we may or may not be familiar with, with the idea of people who are exceptional negotiators. Um, and one of the things that I, I like to do is I like to come back to lists like this when I'm entering into or when I'm about to start a negotiation, I think about what are the qualities that I want to exemplify? What, you know, who do I want to be? I wanna set the intention before every meeting that I do. And this is one of the, the areas where I think sometimes as newer investors, we might struggle is we might think, I have to take action. I have to take action. I have to buy a property. I have to do this. Look at Facebook. All these other people are doing all these things. And, you know, what am I doing? I haven't bought a property this week. And it can be really helpful to let go of some of that pressure and say, I want to be strategic about this. So I'm going to focus on what's in front of me right now. And I'm going to set the intention for what I want to happen during this meeting. So then you think about, okay, what do I want the intention? And then who do I want to be when I show up to this negotiation? So the first thing we want to be is we want to be fantastic listeners. And I'm sure you guys have heard the whole, you know, you've got one mouth and two ears and you should, you know, listen twice as much as you speak. I, I really think the majority of the time, like 75% of the time, we should be listening to what other people are saying, because what people are saying gives us the information that we need to be able to figure out what is the challenge they're having and, and what is a solution that would be viable for them. Um, it also means that people love working with you. You know, people will come back to you again and again. People will refer you to friends and family members because they just love working with you because they felt heard, they felt respected, and because they felt like you offered amazing solutions for their particular challenge. So you want to be you want to be knowledgeable. And that doesn't mean, especially when you're starting out, that you have to know more than anybody else in the room and that you have to be the big shot. Sometimes what it means is being willing to say, you know what, that's a fantastic question. I want to make sure I get you the right answer to that. So let me go and do a little bit of research and I'll circle back with you, you know, within 24, 48 hours and I'm going to get you the right answer to that question that you just asked. We also want to focus on being creative problem solvers. And that's really what we are. I mean, people talk about we're investors and we're this and we're that, but Really, if you look at the best investors, we're just problem solvers. I mean, you look at Paula and Jake and the deals that they've done. What have they done? They have found someone who has a problem and they figured out how they can solve that issue or that challenge. And that's why people want to work with them. And it's about being creative about it. You know, you can have lawyers write any agreement into a contract. So don't worry about, you know, does my clause say this and, and do I have this done correctly? Think about the conversation that needs to happen and the solutions that you can offer and you can figure out the rest of the details later when you have reached an agreement with another party. Um, make sure that you're reliable. So when I talk to wholesalers, um, one of the biggest challenges they have is they'll negotiate with people or they'll try and put deals together with people, but they'll find out that sometimes they can't close. So again, it comes back to making sure that we're strategic. Can I close on this? Do I have my funds lined up? Do I have an introduction to a mortgage broker who will help me put together the private lending? Do I have somebody in my back pocket who told me they have half a million dollars in funds so I know I can go and put in offers? Make sure you're being strategic about the order that you're doing things so that you have the freedom to offer shorter closing dates. Um, you know, be able to offer, say, you know what, I understand you're looking for, you know, 450,000. If I 
can close in 21 days, would you take 425 instead? And make sure you're respectful of people's privacy. Um, it can be very challenging in this sort of technology world and the social media world where we talk about, um, you know, this and that and, and we have to be careful to respect that, you know, a lot of times, especially when we're dealing directly with sellers or, um, you know, when we're talking to people who have high net worth, they might be very private about the type of information that they're sharing with you. And you want them to feel comfortable and confident that you're going to be respectful of that. And when you show, you know, discretion in terms of the information you share with other people and what needs to get out there, then people are going to trust you more. So in order to set yourself up for success when you're negotiating and, and you're talking about creative financing, the first thing you want to do is find people who actually are open to creative financing. And that's one of the biggest challenges I think we have in the market right now is that people don't need to take creative financing. If you are selling a multi-unit building right now, you don't need to take a vendor take back. So if someone is interested in doing that, you want to make sure you understand their situation and how it might be beneficial for them. So the first thing we want to do is talk to people. And I say, you know, without being obnoxious, you don't want to be the person at the family get togethers that people are like, oh, you know what? Bob's coming to the get together. Geez, stay away from him. He never shuts up about real estate. Like you got to have some other things going on in your life too, but don't be shy about telling people, hey, I'm a real estate investor. These are the type of opportunities I'm looking for. And, you know, if someone brings me an opportunity, they get paid too. So make sure people know and understand what it is you do, what type of properties you're looking for so that they can bring you opportunities. And sometimes it's as simple as creating a really interesting elevator pitch, or maybe it's, you know, preparing an investor information package so that instead of having to like talk about yourself face to face, maybe you can offer it as part of, hey, you know, these are the types of deals I do. And here's a little bit about me and my company. The next thing you want to do is make an effort to go places where opportunities will surface. So whether it's landlord groups, investor meetings, family or friend gatherings, it's much more challenging to find deals and opportunities if you're really more comfortable just, you know, being at home uh, on the couch in your pajamas and behind your computer. Because the best opportunities, as Jake and Paula said earlier, you know, they drove around, they saw some properties, they sent out some letters and some, some postcards, they connected with people, and that was how they found some of their absolute best deals. And the other thing you want to do is actively look for motivated sellers, lenders, or joint venture partners, and then spend some time getting to know them. Figure out what's motivating them, and then brainstorm some solutions to their issues. Um, you know, sometimes you don't know what people don't know. So maybe there's an opportunity to ask for a vendor take back mortgage. But if you don't understand someone's situation, then you don't know if that's a solution or just another obstacle that you're actually presenting to them. Corey said, be the flame, not the moth. Have people come discuss what you do with you first. Absolutely. Love that, Corey. So, the first thing that we need to do when we're setting ourselves up to be able to negotiate creative financing is we need to determine the needs of the other person. So whether it's a private lender, whether it's a seller, or whether it's a prospective joint venture partner, first thing we need to do is ask a lot of questions and listen carefully to the answers. You know, put yourself in their shoes, convey empathy. You want to ask open and closed questions. Try and get an understanding of who they are, what their goals are, what they're looking to accomplish. Are they looking for cash flow? Are they in a position, you know, what is their motivation for selling a property? These are some of the biggest questions. I would never you know, throw in an offer with a vendor take back in the initial offer. To me, I'm going to set myself up for success if I try and open up a dialogue, get an understanding, and then present to them the idea of a vendor take back with the benefits that it's going to serve for them. So you want to make sure that you're being observant as you're asking questions and they're answering, you know, watch people's body language, watch people's tone. Most people are not going to just 
you know, barf their life story all over you without a filter the very first or the second time you meet them. It's going to take a little while to build that trust before they open up. So pay attention to what's not being said too, because sometimes that's as telling as what is actually coming out of their mouths. And then make sure you use your resources and your power team to help you gather information to construct a likely scenario and solutions based on what your understanding of the situation is. And we're actually gonna go through a scenario in, uh, in just a few slides so that we can sort of put some context on the, the framework that we're talking about right now. How's everybody doing? Everybody following me so far? We good? So far, so good. Awesome. Okay, good. All right. So step two of our process here, of our negotiation process, is we're going to present solutions. So my primary focus always is, is to present solutions that have a positive impact and a benefit on the other person that we're negotiating with. And we may have to go so far as to say, listen, so this is what I understand from you is that, you know, you're selling the property, um, you know, you'd like to retire, you enjoyed being a landlord, but, you know, you'd like to be able to go and spend more time in Florida. And uh, you've done such a great job taking care of, of the building and the property. You're looking for someone who's going to continue in that tradition and, you uh, but you know, you, you'd like your funds out to be able to fund your retirement. This was your, your long-term goal. So then you can talk about a vendor take back and hey, listen, you know what? You can defer your capital gains with a vendor take back. You know, it'll give you an opportunity to continue to generate income. You know, I can offer you a higher purchase price. There's all these benefits that come from the vendor take back strategy. You want to make sure that you're communicating your solutions really clearly. A confused mind will say no. If someone says, well, what's a vendor take back? And you're like, well, you know, it could be like this, but you could also do it like this. And sometimes I've seen it like this. And, you know, we really should talk to a lawyer. A confused mind will say no. So spend some time if you need to in advance rehearsing, you know, in one or two sentences, what is a vendor take back mortgage and how is it going to benefit them? And as you heard Jake and Paula say earlier, anytime when I'm looking for something or I'm in a negotiation, I always present more than one option for people to choose from. And Jake and Paula, when they were buying the, the nine unit building from the lady, they presented her with two different scenarios. So if, if it's really binary, if it's black or white, people will have a greater likelihood to say no. But if you offer them two or three different options, they are more likely to really sink in and spend some time looking at them, comparing and contrasting them and figuring out which of the options you presented is actually going to meet their needs best. And I find it's much easier. And if you say to someone, well, you know, did you like this one or this one? And they say, well, I like this about this. And, you know, this part over here appealed to me. Then maybe you can put together a third option that combines the best parts of each one. So maybe you come up with a closing date that works, you know, some seller financing that works and, you know, the opportunity to, you know, do some private lending from them in the future on another deal that you're doing. But in order to make all those asks, you have to build that relationship so that there's a level of trust and respect between you. The other thing that I've found has been really helpful over the years is, and no offense to any realtors, because you guys are amazing. Like when I'm in a, a market that I haven't been in before, your ability to find deals and to share information is absolutely phenomenal. The challenge that I found is that sometimes when we've got like us as a buyer, we've got our realtor, we've got the seller's realtor, then we've got the seller and the transfer of information always seems like broken telephone. I don't know if you guys have seen that at all. Um, we've got some truly exceptional realtors out there, but sometimes it can be challenging. So one of the things I like to do is say, hey, do you guys mind? I'd like to put together a one pager to share with the seller to talk about what the um, <laughs> four levels of broken telephone, yes. So I, I want to share with the seller, you know, reasons why they might consider being interested in a vendor take back. And you kind of lay it all out on paper for them. And 
it, it kind of gives everybody a chance to step back and say, you know, I don't have to remember all these little bits and pieces that I'm trying to convey. And I don't have to educate. And it's just, look, here it is in writing. Let's actually talk about this and talk about the benefits of this and whether it's going to, to be helpful for your particular situation or not. The next thing we're going to do is to manage objections effectively. And a lot of us, I mean, I'm not sure how many people in the room are in sales, but a lot of us, you know, we take objections as something to be afraid of. They're actually a really good sign. Um, in my experience, the worst thing someone can do is not raise an objection and just say no right off the bat because there's nothing for you to work from. There's no, there's no grass there for you to be able to grow something from. Like you really want to have that. I'd rather have someone say, I don't like this or no because of this which gives me the opportunity to go back and craft a new solution or to ask more questions and probe for what the challenge is, why this isn't a good solution for them so that I can either present new solutions based on the increased level of in information I have, or I can ask for a little bit of time, go away and craft some new solutions and come back and reopen the discussions. And so I welcome objections. And when people show that they have enough trust in me to be able to honestly share their objections, I think it's such a good sign and it shows me that I, I believe the negotiations are actually going well. So I really enjoy them. And I like to repeat this part of the process until I have a clear answer. Either I have a clear yes, let's move ahead, and we've found the right solution and I'm happy to work with you, or in some, in some circumstances we might have a no. But either way, I'm going to ask for feedback. You know, can you help me understand? Was there something I, you know, something I could have done better? You know, was there something that wasn't clear? Um, feedback is how we improve. And a lot of us spend a lot of time living in this sort of ego land where we're either afraid of or we're not open to feedback, but we're not going to become better at doing what we do if we don't ask for and receive feedback well from other people. You know, if we're still following the same thought processes and the same decision making change that we did five years ago, then we haven't grown as people. And I think as real estate investors, that's what all of us want to do. We want to grow. We want to level up. We want to build our portfolios. We want to create our financial freedom. And if we're not actively seeking out feedback, I believe it really slows the process. So let's spend a couple of minutes now. And this is where we're going to walk the talk. So this is an in real life example. So let's say you've met a fellow investor at an event and they are offering you the opportunity to buy an off-market property from them. They gave you an address and they said it's a duplex burr in progress. So again, taking the process that we talked about earlier before you follow up and book time with the investor to talk about, you know, buying the property, then you're going to reach out to your power team because step one was we want to collect as much information as we can so that we're walking into the negotiation well armed to be able to figure out which creative financing strategies are actually going to be a fit for this situation. So the realtor tells you the property was purchased a year ago as a single family home for 600,000. Given the natural rise in the market, it's now worth about 700. So finished duplexes in the area are selling for 900. That's the information that your superstar realtor has provided for you. Now, let's say your mortgage broker pulls a purview report and goes, hey, by the way, there's three mortgages on the property, property totaling 600K. So you think back and you go, Hmm. So they, the realtor tells me they bought it for 600,000 and the liens on the property, the, the financing on the property now totals 600 K. So the lawyer tells you a contractor has placed a lien on the property for 75,000, which means there's a contractor floating around that hasn't been paid or that has outstanding bills for 75,000. You drive by the property, get out, do a walk around. And it shows you that there's definitely renovations that have been started but the property is nowhere near completion. So everybody following me so far? Everybody understand the situation that we're talking about right now? We're good? Fantastic, okay. So I wanna get you guys thinking about creative financing. So first of all, is this a motivated seller? 
based on the information and the scenario that I've provided to you, is this a motivated seller? Brandon says yes. Tyler says he needs to pay out his contractor. Brandon says he ran out of cash. Yeah, in all likelihood, that's definitely what it looks like. He's now, you know, into the property for what he bought it for. He still owes more to the contractor and the work isn't done yet. So is there room? <laughs> Duplex numbers in Kirkland Lake. <laughs> Corey, you're funny. No, no, you could buy homes like this in Kirkland Lake for less than 200,000, Corey. <laughs> um, all right, so we I think we're all agreed this is a motivated seller. And the most likely reason that they're motivated is that they've run out of money. So anytime I look at buying a property, my first question is always, what is their motivation? What is their problem? And can I fix it? If their problem is they're going through a messy divorce and they need to quickly raise money to pay out their spouse, their ex, so that they don't lose their house, I can fix that problem. That's not a problem that I'll be buying. If their problem is that this place is a money pit and, you know, the, the renovations that are required to get it into livable condition far exceed what the property will be worth after the repairs are completed, that's not a problem I could fix and that's not a problem I wanna take on. So I'm always evaluating, can I fix this? Whether it's me personally, whether it's someone in my network, whether it's with my power team and my support. So my next question is, are you going to ask for a VTB? Knowing what you know now, looking at what the situation has told you, are you going to ask for a VTB? No. Okay, good. Because I see it happen so often where people just throw in an offer and they put a VTB in right away. So if you're not going to ask for a VTB, would you ask now, would you ask for a VTB in the future? Fanny says, yes. Okay, I'm interested, Fanny. Tell me when you believe a good time would be to ask for a VTB. Ah, Adrian says, what do you mean in the future? I like that. So I meant if when you're putting in the initial offer to buy the property, if you're not asking for a VTB now, would you ask for it after you've built a bit of a relationship? I look at this situation and I say a VTB is not a creative financing strategy that is a fit for this particular situation. Exactly, Adrian, there is no equity. So I'm going to move on and I'm going to look at other creative financing strategies that might work here. <clears throat> so what other creative financing or what other novel, interesting, fun things do you think you could do that might make this deal work for you? Anybody have any ideas based on that information, what we could do that might make it work? I'll give you guys a few seconds to think about it. I feel like I need like some Jeopardy, num some Jeopardy music or something like that. Okay, so Adrian's saying consolidate the financing under one loan. Yep, you could look at doing something creative. Again, if if they bought the property for six hundred, there's six hundred owing for financing. Plus, there's a seventy five thousand um, dollar lien on the property, and it's only worth seven hundred. So, we're not going to get. There's probably not going to be a lot of room to do some stuff. Um, so, Cash said wholesale. Well, I would wholesale the deal if I didn't want to do it myself. But I look at this and I go, maybe there's an opportunity for uh, like a rent to own strategy. So I would assume responsibility, like I would pay a set amount per month, whatever the, the costs are to cover the financing. And then I would say, I'm going to buy this property from you in six months for $700,000, or maybe I'd buy it for six seventy five dollars because I like to make some money in the buy. So six months from now, I'm going to stop the bleeding from you. I'm going to take over this property. In the meantime, I'm going to spend $100,000, finish this renovation, legalize it as a duplex, and then um, I'm going to sell it or refinance it for upwards of $900,000 in the future. So what I want to do is 
figure out, and this is Brandon said, convert it to a duplex, the value is 900. Absolutely. If it only costs me, you know, $100,000 to finish the conversion to duplex, I've just made $100,000. And maybe I hold on to it and I, I buy it, you know, and then refinance it in the future. And Adrian says, speak to the contractor to negotiate a lower lien payment. Yeah, you can, you know, have your lawyer on your power team go back and say, listen, we're going to take this over. We're going to make sure that you get paid something. I know you're owed 75. Would you be willing to take 65? So as soon as we flip out of the what do I need and, and the traditional stuff, then we start being really creative. How can we help this seller? And again, I'm only interested in helping if it's a problem that I can solve. If it's a money pit, that's not a problem I want to take on. But if there's an opportunity where I can look at something and say, you know, what is the value of the property right now? Let's freeze it there. And then, you know, I'll come in with the balance of the renovation funds. I'll manage the renovation, get it done. Then we sell it and I take some and, and you know, you're made whole. Maybe that's a good solution, you know, whether it's a partnership or a rent to own or something along those lines. And the next question I have for you is what important questions do you need to ask the seller in order to lay the foundation to be able to negotiate creative financing? What questions do you think it's important to ask to get the information that we need to be able to start coming up with these solutions? Anybody have any ideas before I go to the next slide? Brandon says, I want the complete backstory. Absolutely. And keep in mind, you will get a version of that. You will not probably get the, the, full, the full story, everything that happened, every mistake they made. Most people are very um, hesitant to share areas where they have made mistakes. So Janetta says, are they paying to break their mortgage? Okay, so Janetta, are you asking about penalties if they if they sell or break their mortgage okay so yeah so these are the this is a list of the questions that i would want to ask uh, to be able to determine which creative financing strategy would work so my first thing is what is your original goal with the property you know, sometimes investors get themselves into hot water because they get so stuck in a scenario where it's like, I'm going to do a flip. I'm going to do a flip. I'm going to do a flip. And then when it doesn't work for the flip, there's no plan B. There's no plan C. They have no, you know, other exit strategy and it traps them. They're trapped by this property. So what was their original goal? Can I come up with other exit strategies that might potentially yield more money? So maybe you know, I could sell it as a duplex right now for 900,000, but if I was willing to keep it and do a rent to own on it in three years, maybe I could sell it for, you know, 1.1 million. And that might make an awful lot more sense. I'm going to make more money. Plus I'm going to have the higher cash flow that would come from a rent to own. And that's literally all I'm doing is changing the exit strategy. So my next question is what got in the way of achieving their goal? So do, do these people have a problem that I can fix between myself, my knowledge, my support team, my, my power team? Is this a problem that I can solve? Because I don't buy problems that I can't fix. I want to know who the decision makers are. So I might have met this one investor at, at an event and he says, yeah, go check out my property. But then you find out that... Um, that he's got a couple of business partners and, and that wasn't mentioned, but you're not actually negotiating just with him. Ideally, anytime you're negotiating, you wanna have all the decision makers in one place and you're talking to all of them at once to be able to have some sort of um, speed and urgency in terms of getting this done. Um, what is their break even point? So this is always one of my questions. You know, we talked about they bought it for 600. We talked about, you know, they've got 600 in, in loans on the property plus a $75,000 lien. What is not factored into those numbers? What's missing that is good that they're going to count towards their break even point? I know it's late guys. I'm sorry, I'm getting you to think. <laughs> What, what, what critical expense category have we missed in talking about the numbers so that we understand what their break-even point is? <laughs> I 
<laughs> okay, Tyler, you're you're in the right direction. Yeah, so there's taxes. What else would be here? What other expenses have they incurred that are outside of what we've talked about? I know you guys know this. 100% know you guys know this. Okay, Brandon said down payment. Well, they've kind of lost their down payment. There we go. The carrying costs. Awesome. The carrying costs and the closing costs aren't factored into this at all. So if we buy the property from them for six seventy five, dollars which is what they owe to other people, they are losing everything else that they have put into the deal. So how receptive do you think they're going to be for an offer of six seventy five? dollars Do we think that they're going to like think this is amazing and gobble it up right away? Or do you think that that's maybe going to take some, some convincing for them? It's probably going to take some time, isn't it? And this is absolutely some convincing. So this is another key question I like to ask. Are they currently behind on any of their payments? Because that tells me the urgency, the timelines. What are we looking at? Has someone started power of sale proceedings or foreclosure proceedings against them? Are we looking at, you know, 21 days until they lose the property? If that's the case, most people would go, heck, you know what? 675 for you to take it off my hands in 21 days and stop the bleeding. Absolutely. Do it. Done. I'm fine with that. Other people would go, no, I, I've, I've, you know, I'm using the, the cash flow from other properties to fund this. Like I'm not willing to sell at a, at a deep discount. But we, we can't answer any of those questions or we can't come up with any ideas if we don't have a really solid understanding of what their situation is and what is motivating them. So key takeaways, I'm hoping that everybody got from, uh, from this presentation today. The needs of the other parties should come first every single time. Every deal is different, so make sure you take the time to think and to plan strategically before you just get right in there, you know, throw in an offer with a vendor take back on it. Like, take the time to be strategic about it, learn what you can about the deal that you're going into, and then set yourself up. And, you know, I've, I've had situations where I've had clients, and they've said that someone is, is selling, um, and they've put three different offers together, like Jake and Paula. You know, here's here's one with a VTB, here's here's one with a lower price, but no VTB. And then here's one that sort of combines a small VTB with a mid-level price. And then people have the opportunity to make their decision. And I want people to remember that trying to be creative without building a relationship can actually cause you to miss out on an opportunity. So you're going to listen 75% more than you speak, carefully plan what to ask for and the best time to ask it when you are thinking about creative financing and negotiating with people. So here's where you can find me if you want to reach out and chat. I love talking about real estate. Um, I'll do it all day long. So if you would like to book uh, time with me to learn more about um, any of my services, would love to hear from you. I have a Calendly link. You're more than welcome to book a discovery call with me. And uh, Jen, I'm going to hop back over to you. That's amazing. Did you guys have that screen up long enough? Did you want to, uh, maybe, I don't know, Elizabeth, if you want to put that on, it wasn't uh, yeah. just so people can take a quick, maybe screenshot or something. Sure. Um, holy smokes. So did I like, was I right? Or was I right? When I told you <laughs> Elizabeth would be sharing a ton of information and really taking us to school tonight, like this is all so actionable and so at such a necessary part of learning how to be an investor is learning everything that you just said, negotiation skills and really being a great listener. Oh, Corey's got the emojis. Thank you, Corey. <laughs> Fantastic. That was awesome. Um, I'm going to pop in here and see what we have because I did notice some questions. Um, now, I don't know if you maybe had answered some along the way here. Um, um, I kept an eye on the chat box, but when I had the screen open, I couldn't see the Q&A. So I can see Ben had, uh, oh, no, we're good with that one. So Tyler yeah. had said, so is step one lining up private lending or should you look for the deal first? That's a fantastic question, Tyler. And it's a little bit like the chicken and the egg. 
<laughs> like which came first. Um, in, in my experience, when you're being strategic, I like to learn what my financing options are first. So like with my coaching clients, one of the first things we do is we get connected with a good mortgage broker and figure out, are there financing options available there? And if it's okay, we need to look at joint venture. If, you know, uh, a lenders are exhausted, B lenders, it's not going to work. So we're looking at joint venture partners and private lenders then we're already starting to build that as we're starting to look for deals. Um, it's a lot easier to have a deal and look for partners or lenders than it is to start fresh and say, hey, I, you know, I, I don't have any deals or anything I'm working on, but what you can do is do samples. So you can say, hey, here's a property that's on MLS. This is what I would do with it if you don't have a lot of experience to work from. Um, you can say, you can create the way I, I created a scenario. You can do something similar. You can you know, run the numbers and say, you know, this is a property I was looking at. This is the structure that I was looking at. You know, these are the types of returns it would have generated. And if you're interested in properties like this, you know, give me your email address and I'll send it out to you when something like that comes along. Um, it, it's finding deals right now is, is the, the point of scarcity. Um, there's a lot of options out there. There's a lot of people looking for deals and opportunities, looking for, for places to park their money. Um, so the, the deal pipeline is really where the scarcity is. And that's where I think we, we need to put our focus. But I think it's a mistake to look for deals without at least knowing, do I have financing options available and what are they? Great point. Great point. Um, Kristen is asking, what are your thoughts on letters of intent if you find the partner before the property? Good question, Kristen. Um, personally, I, I don't mind letters of intent, but I wouldn't want to, to, to hold someone to something. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't want to say if someone has, you know, the ability to do one deal and I don't have anything for six months, I don't expect them to wait for me to find a deal. If they have an opportunity that's come up, then I would expect them to do what's in their best interest. So I'm going to make sure that we have, you know, a conversation about realistic expectations and what needs to happen. Um, I don't know. I'm a little bit like I was super intense when I started investing in real estate and I would hammer stuff and I'd be like 10 o'clock at night and I'm on the phone and I'm negotiating. And, and I find that what's happened over the last few years is I kind of stopped and I take a breath and I'm like, I've got this, like, I, I don't have the pressure. So I'm like, what's supposed to happen will happen. And all of a sudden, just by letting go of this, like insane need to control everything, I'm like, everything has a flow to it. And so I believe that when I have a deal, I will have the right investor, I will have someone to partner with. One of the biggest mistakes we can make, and I've made it, and I'm willing to talk about it, one of the biggest mistakes we can make is taking on partners without making sure they're the right fit for us. Because you're, you're committed to them, you're locked in. The only way to get out of it is to sell the property or one party buys the other out. So making sure that, you know, you have the right part, the right partners in place if you're in a position where you're JVing is really important. It's not having a warm body in the room. It's having the right person. Great point. Um, let me see. Sean, did you have any questions come up? I'm just uh, trying to get back into the chat here to see. I don't see any more. No, you're shaking your head now. That no, was Okay. That was a ton of fantastic information. And I don't know about you guys, but I took some pictures of the slides as they were going out. <laughs> um, but we will, I mean, normally I record all these on the Onria page. I know Elizabeth, you're hosting this uh, since we had to flip over to you. And thank you again so, so much for your help. And tonight, okay. this wouldn't be happening right now, guys, if Elizabeth wasn't like, hold on, I got you, I can get this done. <laughs> put together a whole new webinar in like five minutes. So thank you so much. Uh, so this is being recorded and we'll figure out how we get it uh, posted to the Onria YouTube channel. Um, let me see here. I think that's all the questions for tonight, unless anyone has anything else or Corey, or do you have anything you want to pipe up with? I think there was a one question in there just said, uh, what about having a letter of intent before... Um, before you get the deal, like when you find the partner before the property? Or do we already answer that one? Yeah, we got that one. I think the main thing here, guys, 
is, you know, the only way you're going to be able to practice negotiation skills is to start actually going out and putting in offers, right? And talking to people. Um, so with that, um, you know, if obviously Elizabeth has uh, quite, uh, she's quite good at education, you know, breaking things down and explaining them in a way that's digestible, um, if that makes sense. Because I know a lot of times when we talk about, you know, real estate investing, it can seem very sort of big picture. Whereas, you know, I love that you gave an actual example of like what might happen, um, which is fantastic. So uh, reach out to Elizabeth if you are looking for any coaching or you're looking for some more, um, some more help in this area. Uh, she is obviously extremely knowledgeable and willing to help. Thank so you. thank you so much, Elizabeth, for your time tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I love doing this. I have so missed, you know, being able to, to teach and to share. And, you know, as much as I love real estate, it, it's really given me my passion for, for helping others. So I really appreciate the opportunity. You guys are so sweet to have me back. And, you know, to be able to, to follow Jake and Paula, it's kind of a <laughs> tough show. Like <laughs> those guys, they just kind of blow your socks off, right? So thank you so much. And, and Corey, it was lovely to see you here too. I know we keep trying to connect and we just keep missing. So looking forward to connecting with you in the next little bit too. We will for sure. And guys, if you want to hear more from Elizabeth, Elizabeth, you have a Facebook, uh, I don't, is it a Facebook business page where you post some of the conversations that you've had with people? Um, so I have a, a Facebook group, which is um, interactive and people can just come and ask questions. It's for investors across the country. So you get, you know, if you're in Ontario and you're looking to invest in BC, you can connect with uh, people out there. It en enables people to network. Um, I also host two webinars a month. So I have one on Mon uh, Monday evening, which is uh, just typically a panel type um, presentation. So like we just had one on Monday night and we talked about joint ventures and how to structure them and how they work. And then I usually have a, a Monday lunchtime one, which is someone coming in and uh, presenting intensive information on like, this is something that would benefit investors. So my last one was Andre from Scotia Bank talking about uh, the Scotia Bank kind of investor program and, and why invest, why Scotia Bank is, is a go-to for so many investors. Awesome. And how can people find those webinars or sign up for this? Um, you can just follow me on my professional page, Elizabeth Kelly Consulting. And um, once you're in, you know, once you're, you register for one, then you'll automatically get the, uh, the prompts to register for future ones. Um, my past webinars are also on my YouTube channel as well. I think I have a whopping like 170 <laughs> subscribers or something on YouTube. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time over there. But um, yeah, and I'm happy, of course, I'll send this presentation over to you guys for for the Onria stuff too. It's I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Awesome. Well, we appreciate your time and, uh, and the time you took to combine the different talks. I'm like, can you just do a little bit of everything? <laughs> <laughs> So anyhow, thank you again. Um, let me see here. It's 10 to 9. And typically we like to sort of wrap things up just so we're respecting your time, um, everyone that's it's in attendance. Are there any other questions or anything? Um, actually, I have a question for everyone here. Uh, one of the pillars of Onria is, of course, taking action. And I think it's really helpful to let people know what you're working on, um, not only to, again, you know, talk about building your network and having people know what you do, but also for a bit of accountability on your own end. Uh, so why don't you guys put in the chat, what are you working on right now? Either, you know, it's in the works that you're excited about, or it's a goal, you know, in the next four weeks, what are you taking action on, whether you are a brand new investor, or you know anywhere along the spectrum. Uh, so go ahead, I'm gonna have you guys, I wanna see lots of stuff happening, popping in the chat here. Tell us what you're gonna be working on. Uh, in the meantime, I am going to tell you what I am working on. And uh, over the next four weeks, I will be pulling together our next Onria event. Fingers crossed Zoom actually works for me this time and our webinar doesn't get canceled. So bizarre, it was there this morning and not there this evening. Anyhow, um, so next month is uh, November's event. 
Our next Onria meeting is Thursday, November the 18th. So if you haven't, uh, if you've got your phone handy, uh, you can open up your calendar and put it in there. Thursday, November the 18th, same time, 7 p.m. We are going to be having, uh, I can tell you, I won't tell you who yet, but I will tell you what we're going to be talking about. Uh, so next month, we plan on talking about short-term rentals. Um, and you might remember, before we broke for the summer break, uh, we sort of talked a little bit about cottage rentals. Uh, this time, we're going to be talking about short-term rentals as an investment strategy and more as a high level. So um, who I have coming in does not live near a lake. You know, it's not like a vacation spot, but they have added short-term rentals as part of their revenue stream. It's another strategy that they've added on to what they're already doing. And uh, she's going to share you know, systems. She's going to share the um, tools that they use to manage their short-term rentals. So like Paula and Jake were saying, you know, they realized they really didn't like being landlords. Perhaps short-term rental strategy is something that you want to take a look at. And that might be uh, something you want to do. Uh, the other, uh, I'm, we're going to have a panel as our other speaker. And uh, what we're going to be talking about is failures. You know, I mentioned this uh, I did a live on the weekend. Sean and I won some awards um, for investing and, and that sort of thing. And the first thing I thought of after we walked off that stage was not all of the highlight reel, but the things that we failed at. Um, because I think that's something that needs to be talked about more. You know, there's going to be wins and that's a great thing. You need to celebrate those wins, but there's also going to be things that don't go the way you plan them to go. <laughs> and it's okay, it's part of the process. And I think we sort of, when we only talk about the wins that we only you know, talk about that side of investing, it's not realistic. We need to talk about the things that don't go as planned and how do we you know, navigate that? What have other investors done to get through those fails? Because you know, the people I have coming on are all very successful. Um, and it's just part of the process that's going to happen. So that is planned for next month. Make sure you put it in your calendar. I'm going to go back here and see what people are doing in the next four weeks. So what do we have here? Uh, Paula is going to buy a property in Florida. Yeah, come join us down here. <laughs> uh, let's see. I don't know if it's Kayana or Kajana. I'm sorry. Uh, wrapping up a duplex conversion in Windsor. Awesome. Looking for multifamily property in the Chatham-Windsor area. Great spot. Uh, Corian is refinancing your first income property. Excellent. Refinance that baby and put it back to work. Um, getting my development moving again. Corey is fantastic. Offering on a cottage rental. Good. Offer went in yesterday. Whereabouts, Corey? Uh, let's see. Ange, setting up an entity for investing in the States. Oh, you know what? Not a bad idea. Uh, and taking a course this weekend on in Canadians investing in the U.S. Uh, is that with, oh, I just lost his name now. I can see his face. Mm, who is it? Lens. Glenn Sutherland. Glenn Sutherland. I could see his face in my head. Um, <laughs> let's see. Sandra's going to see a potential property this weekend. Alex and Tanya closing on two projects. One flip, one fourplex. Amazing. And a conversion. Uh, three flips, refinance to pull money out to do a JV multifamily. Nikki, well done. I love it. Lots of stuff going on there. Uh, we're going to finance your third property, rent to own from Janetta, multi fur, Airbnb, looking at retirement. Woo retirement. Love it. Uh, let's see. So much going on. Buying another 60 units. Was that you, Sean? Are we buying another 60 units? Oh, we are. Okay. You know. I love that you're learning about it on here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for keeping me in the loop. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Lori and Matt selling a flip, closing on a new flip, and looking for our first short-term rental. Yeah, you know what? Short-term rentals, it's a really interesting um, strategy that people do differently, right? 
they don't have to all be lakeside, you know, in a touristy spot. You, there's lots of people that do really well performing short-term rentals in like a subdivision, which is very strange to me. So I'm interested in learning about this a little bit more. Um, and to be quite honest, I think given the nature ha things happening in Canada, I think there's going to be a lot of staycations for the next while. So short-term rentals is going to be a great strategy to get into. Uh, amazing, guys. Thank you so much for your time and for joining us and rolling with the punches tonight as we had to flip over to a different meeting. Um, you know, I really appreciate your time. And if you got value out of this evening, um, then I would love if you would say so online. You know, talk about us, put us in your stories or make a comment, tag us. Uh, I'm probably giving you too many options here, but uh, <laughs> make sure you definitely head to our Facebook or Instagram and like and follow and all that good stuff. Um, in the meantime, I'm hoping I still have everyone's email addresses and I can send you the link to the replay. If you do not get that link, just go and follow us on social media and I will be posting the link there to our YouTube video. Okay, the, the re recording of this tonight. Okay, anything else, Sean? Did I miss anything? I feel like I, I'm rambling a little bit. No, that's great. Um, just wanted to also say thank you to the speakers for tonight. Both uh, were awesome. I uh, enjoyed both of myself. And thank you, Jen, for taking the reins as usual and doing a magnificent job. So thanks, everybody, for joining us again for Andrea now that we're back um, after the break. And uh, looking forward to another one next month. Awesome. I'll be there for sure. I'm excited. And congratulations, guys. Huge honors this weekend and so well deserved. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Well, Elizabeth, I will leave it to you to close us off for tonight. So thank you again. And everyone have a fun and productive month. Bye, everyone.